this. Uh, I'm a PhD student uh, from uh, Laboratory of RNA Biology and Biotechnology in, of uh, Mich Professor Michela Alessandra Denti in uh, Trento, uh, Cibio. So what you see here in the picture is actually Cibio with its uh, beautiful uh, background uh, in, uh, in Trento. And uh, as you know, the, the main topic of today is uh, uh, pitfalls and problems in uh, uh, microRNA expression uh, analysis. So um, I give you a brief introduction on microRNAs, um, even if I'm sure you know, uh, you all know uh, what they are. So um, um, they are uh, uh, so small encoding RNA molecules. They are about uh, 21, uh, 25 uh, nucleotides. Uh, uh, they are processed in the nucleus uh, uh, by first by the Drosha complex, and then they are exported uh, and uh, cut again by by dice. dice. So we have first the prime microRNA, then we have the the pre microRNA, and then the mature uh, the mature microRNA that is uh, uh, inserted in uh, uh, the in the risk complex, and then through that uh, it. Uh, hybridizes to its target uh, either perfectly or leading to the degradation of the messenger RNA so to of its target or uh, with the, an imperfect uh, uh, complementarity so leading to just translation uh, uh, repression um, it can bind uh, the, either the uh, three prime UTR or the coding sequence or even the five prime UTR, even if uh, majorly is just on uh, uh, the three prime uh, uh, the three prime UTR. So um, it is a post transcriptional regulation of uh, uh, gene expression, and uh, here uh, I wrote that uh, uh, we have a. Uh, basically a redundant molecular network of microRNAs. This is because microRNAs, uh, a single microRNA can bind uh, uh, different uh, uh, mRNAs and uh, um, a single messenger RNA can be bound by different uh, microRNAs. So that's why we have uh, uh, redundant molecular networks. And uh, uh, what is interesting about microRNAs is that they are used uh, also as um, uh, cellular um, cell to cell communicators basically and they are basically so released by the cell uh, either with an energy dependent method so when uh, the cell uh, basically break apart and uh, they are released uh, in the, the extracellular uh, environment or through um, an energy dependent way so in microvesicle exosomes apoptotic bodies uh, or lipoproteins proteins uh, so but what is important is that they are released and then they are taken by other cells. So um, they can reflect uh, quite well physiological and also pathological changes in cells, tissues and organs uh, and, and, and the body as a whole. And uh, so going um, to do what is the main topic, so the uh, mere expression analysis challenges, um, so we know that uh, the main source of microRNA, so apart, uh, of course, cells, uh, we have tissues uh, and then uh, biofluids like uh, uh, plasma or serum or saliva. And uh, uh, the main challenges come from the source uh, uh, preparation. So we lack basically standardized protocols for the processing of uh, um, the, the different tissues, the different, uh, the different biofluids. And this is uh, actually a, a major factor. Then uh, uh, we have uh, the challenges in detection techniques, which mainly are uh, so PCR uh, sequencing, microRNA, and we'll see that. And they lack uh, sensitivity and the specificity, mainly at the, at the single base level. And um, since they all uh, basically rely on uh, a relative quantification, we need normalization, accurate normalization methods. And uh, we do not have uh, an universal normalizer for um, microRNA expression or something that is used uh, um, mostly, some, like, for example, GPDH for uh, messenger uh, RNA. So I start from uh, uh, sorry from uh, uh, the from uh, from tissues for example. So problems that uh, uh, come with uh, with tissue managing. 
and uh, the main sources of tissues are fresh, uh, so fresh tissues, uh, flash frozen or FFPE, so um, formalin fixed and paraffin embedded tissues. The problems here come with, uh, uh, for example, uh, the stability of the uh, RNAs in a different tissue, so different in a frozen or FFPE tissue. So if we have, for example, um, pair the, the same tissue, but one uh, piece is frozen, the other is in uh, uh, slices, for example, in, uh, is an FFP. Uh, do we have uh, uh, differences on uh, RNA stability, so in microRNAs in this case? Well, um, I highlight this, uh, this uh, study here, where basically they did uh, a micro, uh, microarray uh, analysis on the microRNAs of tissues, uh, myocardial tissues in this case, uh, either from frozen tissues or FFP tissues. And here you see also how old basically these tissues are. So when they are one year and one year older, the correlation between the expression of the microRNAs uh, of the microRNA, sorry, between the two uh, kind of samples is basically, uh, it's, it's very good, so basically uh, we have uh, the same uh, expression, uh, and so uh, the same uh, recovery and stability of the microRNA, but uh, when the tissues becomes older and older, uh, you see here that the correlation starts to break uh, to break apart, and so you do not have a, a real uh, reliable uh, reliable tissues. And uh, this is confirmed also by this other study where they hit a, these are uh, NGS uh, um, data. And uh, again, you see that uh, these are uh, quite uh, uh, um, young. Uh, let's say, um, uh, tissues, so we're talking about one, two-year tissues, and you see that the correlation between uh, FFP and frozen uh, uh, pair tissues um, is, is held. So microRNA uh, is... Um, is um, is preserved, but uh, again, it's uh, more uh, about uh, the time, uh, about the time of the, and uh, how old uh, is basically sorry the age of the of the tissue that uh, can influence really influence the the uh, the stability of the microRNA. Uh, Actually, it's not only that, uh, we have problem also in the fix fixation itself. So if you're dealing with uh, FFP tissues and you're trying to express, uh, sorry, to uh, analyze the expression of some microRNAs, you have to be aware of the fact that probably uh, the GC content and uh, the RNA structure itself uh, can uh, lead to different uh, stability of uh, uh, the RNA and uh, especially for uh, micro for micro RNAs. Uh, here I put some uh, several literature that talks about uh, uh, this uh, issue and here I highlight just uh, one graph from uh, one paper uh, published in PLOS One uh, where basically they uh, analyze the expression uh, uh, again of uh, some micro RNAs uh, in either FFP or the pair the frozen uh, tissue and then they divided uh, the micro RNAs uh, uh, in groups depending on the full change so the difference of the expression between the two tissues so the ones that are uh, less expressed we can say in FFP the ones that are basically unchanged and the ones that are more expressed so looking at the full change and you can see that uh, this group uh, uh, can be uh, are can be distinguished discriminated uh, also by their GC content so saying that uh, probably uh, the GC content that affects uh, then of course the sequence and then uh, uh, the structure uh, that can uh, uh, that can be taken by the, the microRNA can probably <coughs> can probably uh, affect the uh, recovery of the RNA and the stability of the microRNA after uh, formalin uh, uh, fixation. Uh, then, of course, uh, the other major uh, issue is storage. Uh, as you all know, we've been we've been taught uh, to uh, keep the the rna at uh, minus 80. Uh, actually there are a lot of studies talking about also rna kept uh, at minus 20 with uh, little or no no degradation for uh, not too much time basically so we're talking about some month not more so again uh, minus 80 is preferable but uh, mm, Let's say that is again uh, a more a matter of 
how old is uh, how old is the tissue how old is the rna it's already for example extracted is it in trisol or is it still in the tissue so uh, the storage is uh, is an issue well depending on where is your uh, is your rna in this case um uh, talking about other tissues uh, uh, in this case biofluids like uh, for example serum and plasma you can encounter some problems if you have if you deal for example with the patient samples or uh, samples from uh, if you work with uh, animals like mice so maybe you you, you will use uh, serum or plasma uh, samples so um, usually uh, they are in low titer so it's more difficult to um, detect them and analyze them uh, for human so human being we are talking about uh, uh, picomolar levels I suggest you to, to read this uh, nice paper in PNAS uh, by Tush Group, uh, where they did uh, uh, NGS studies on health individuals, uh, um, also at, like, say, um, at time zero, and then uh, uh, at different time points, uh, checking out the um, microRNA expression in serum and plasma. And uh, then, uh, Again, uh, uh, source preparation, so cellular contamination or hemolysis, as you know, we can have this rupture in, uh, of uh, platelets of red blood cells, so contamination from, uh, of micronates coming from this, uh, from this kind, type of cells. Uh, then extracellular vesicles, so of course we have extracellular micronate coming from extracellular vesicles, so again if you have some, you could have some contamination from cells, extracellular vesicles coming from these cells. So or just even be aware of the fact that uh, uh, we have different type extracellular vesicles coming from different cell type and so with bearing uh, different uh, uh, cargos, uh, uh, talking about uh, microRNA in this case. And then, uh, uh, for example, uh, gender specificity. So there are um, there is an increasing interest uh, in uh, uh, studying microRNA expression uh, uh, Checking also at the uh, gender specificity of uh, of uh, the, of this expression. So uh, it seems that there are some micronates that are more or less expressed depending on uh, on uh, on the gender. And uh, this actually is still debated. Uh, the the same paper in the Tush group, for example, uh, uh, they uh, concluded that. Uh, there is there is not such a, a difference, but uh, uh, for example, uh, there are other studies uh, talking about this difference. Even in our group, uh, we uh, we saw uh, uh, some uh, some difference in on uh, in some microRNAs, uh, uh, depending on whether they came from uh, tissues of, or female or male tissues, uh, and uh, this for animals, for human beings, and. And so on. So maybe you can, you will, you want just to be aware of this uh, uh, possibility. And then uh, other factors could be, for example, uh, prandial state or monal state, uh, like for a uh, menstrual cycle. If you are dealing with uh, 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 samples from uh, um, from human beings or and. Uh, uh, or from mammals in uh, in uh, in general and. Uh, uh, Again, it, it seems that in this case, for example, uh, you do not have uh, this uh, such difference uh, between, for example, uh, the different stage of the menstrual cycle or, for example, for prandial state. So if you have uh, eaten or not before the sampling of your blood, but, uh, uh, it's something we need to take care of uh, when uh, uh, dealing with uh, this kind of samples uh, and uh, uh, microRNA uh, expression analysis and uh, well you will see in literature a lot of uh, debate among uh, if um, uh, is plasma in this case uh, better than uh, uh, is plasma better than serum but uh, Actually, it's there is no right answer. The right answer just rely um, is um, lies on the fact that uh, depends on really on the question you are uh, you're asking. So the, the experiments you are uh, you are making, and uh, the microRNAs you want to to check, and. Um, Talking about uh, uh, again my sample processing. So the the what I was talking about. Uh, uh, so for example, cellular contamination. In this uh, nice paper, they uh, check at the different type of plasma processing, and they found. Uh, so as you know, there are different centrifugation steps, uh, and uh, 
So uh, you have uh, here, um, I just highlighted this, uh, the cloudy supernatant, uh, so the first centrifugation step, and then the first supernatant, so second centrifugation step, because from S1 to S2 basically there's no difference. And uh, they evaluated the expression of uh, non-contaminant micronase, so the micronase that in theory do not come from this type of cells, so white blood cells, leukocytes, or red blood cells. And uh, the expression of these micronase from CS to S1 is basically uh, the same, so you don't see too much of difference, or at least it's not statistically significant. And uh, if you go on uh, contaminant micronase, so the ones that come from cells, of course you see a lot of difference. So again, just to highlight the fact that uh, you have to be uh, very careful and very aware of the micronase you are studying and where they come, uh, where they come from. In this case, talking about uh, uh, plasma samples. And again, uh, uh, for uh, in this case, uh, for platelet, possible platelet contamination, in this uh, uh, other nice paper, they um, analyzed the expression of some microRNAs uh, um, in a different type of uh, enriched or poor samples uh, uh, for, um, from platelets. So we have platelet concentrated plasma, plus, uh, platelet uh, so rich uh, or poor or filtrated. And for example, if you see the microRNA 223, which is platelet derived, uh, of course, uh, you see a, a lot of difference between the different type of uh, processing. Instead, if you take 451, that is a rod, red blood cells derived, uh, you see uh, uh, less difference among the different samples. So, again, uh, be aware of this, uh, uh, of this possible, uh, of this possible um, uh, contamination and uh, differences among um, sample processing. Then, uh, after the, uh, the source uh, processing, we have to do RNA extraction. The, let's say that the most used uh, method is with uh, ganidium, uh, ganidium thiocyanide and uh, uh, so phenol chloroform extraction. And uh, I want to talk to you about this uh, uh, very nice paper from the American group. Uh, it's a letter to self that they uh, sent after uh, the retraction of a paper where basically they were misled in uh, their conclusions uh, due to problem of uh, RNA extraction. So what they conclude, uh, and I will tell you why, that the short structured RNAs, uh, like microRNAs of course, uh, with the low GC contact uh, are selectively lost during extraction from a small number of cells. And in fact what they, they saw is that um, starting from different amount uh, of cells, uh, two different microRNAs are recovered, as you see here from this uh, gel, uh, in a uh, different, uh, different way. And they did the same experiment with synthetic microRNAs, so again the same two microRNAs, but in this case synthetic, and uh, uh, again starting from a uh, different uh, uh, amount of cells, and again the recovery is different. So meaning that there is something uh, uh, of the microRNA itself that is giving some uh, some problem in this case, and uh, from this nice graph, what you see, uh, well, maybe they plotted uh, the thermodynamic stability of the of the different microRNAs and the, their GC content against the full change uh, of the microRNA is extracted from subconfluent cells over. Uh, the microRNA extracted from confluent uh, uh, cells, so low amounts of cells and high amount of cells. And you can see that there are some microRNAs, as the one for one here, that is uh, basically uh, lost during RNA extraction. As you see here, the full change is uh, uh, low, so you have less expression of the microRNA coming from the subconfluent cells. So meaning that uh, Again, the GGC content and structure uh, of, uh, the, of the microRNA can influence and can affect uh, the recovery. And actually, if, if you remember, we were talking about GC content also for the fixation. So, uh, again, uh, highlighting the fact that uh, how the RNA is structured uh, is, uh, um, is, uh, is important. Mm -hmm. 
in some way, somehow. And uh, we saw something similar actually in uh, in our work we did in our uh, in our lab. Uh, in this case, from uh, plasma, we did uh, a simple experiment of a calibration curve for uh, uh, from synthetic RNA oligospikein, either re reversely, directly um, reverse transcribed, or uh, starting from the plasma and put together with uh, with uh, with trisome. Uh, and uh, as you can see here, we did it for cell, uh, um, so cell against microRNA 39 and for uh, uh, the human uh, um, microRNA 21. And you can see, so the two curves here uh, differs, and uh, as you can expect from, because you have something, a loss in uh, RNA uh, recovery. But uh, uh, here, basically, the, the loss of RNA recovery becomes more and more evident uh, here and also here. Um, as uh, the spike in uh, is uh, uh, less and less uh, basically concentrated. So, again, saying that uh, there is something going on uh, in uh, uh, the RNA extraction. Here we uh, put an, an average RNA recovery of 45%, so something that is uh, actually uh, quite of, uh, scary. And um, so, um, after uh, the, the RNA extraction, of course, uh, uh, we need to detect these microRNAs, and uh, the the main uh, uh, detection uh, techniques. Uh, so are so the main one, of course, is qPCR. Uh, qPCR has some problems for microRNAs because uh, the microRNAs has a short sequence. So. Um, being a short sequence, you have difficulty in uh, designing primers because, in theory, if you use uh, the normal, uh, uh, let's say, your rules that you use for a messenger RNA, basically you should cover all the microRNAs. And so this is uh, uh, quite difficult. Then you have low specificity at a single base level, as uh, for every um, as for the an amplification, and then you have amplification biases because different uh, uh, sequences can be amplified uh, uh, differently, and uh, especially in this case that is a short sequence. And then you have a major problem in distinguishing uh, isomer, so microRNAs that basically are the same, just for except for one or two bases. And then uh, pre and uh, prime microRNAs, so basically the uh, immature form uh, of uh, uh, the microRNAs, uh, especially the pre the, the pre microRNAs, which can be uh, let's say confounded by uh, the uh, the PCR not discriminating between the immature and the mature uh, form. So the companies try to um, uh, let's say overcome these uh, uh, these uh, these problems. Uh, we have uh, two main methods of uh, detecting microRNAs and uh, actually two main methods of doing uh, the reverse transcription uh, part. One is with the universal primer, so we have in this case a polyadenylation first, then you have a universal tag with the T, poly-T, then so cDNA, uh, so the, the, the reverse transcription, then you have a, a near specific uh, primer uh, for the real-time uh, uh, amplification. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, also individual stem loop primers, so the ones uh, that are specific uh, uh, already uh, starting uh, from uh, uh, the, uh, the reverse transcription uh, uh, step. And uh, so the stem loop here in this case is uh, is a longer, is a more stable, so it can uh, attach here to the to the microRNAs and give uh, a specificity, let's say, advance um, uh, advantage. While for the universal primer, mm, they mainly are used uh, uh, RNA molecules, uh, uh, so they are more stable because they are modified nucleic acids, and so they also can uh, uh, stabilize uh, the melting temperature that can be different between microRNAs and micro uh, and microRNA. Uh, but uh, there are some differences between the two methods and uh, in this uh, um, nice paper here they showed uh, where uh, how different the two different techniques behave differently in uh, uh, with different microRNAs. So uh, they divided the microRNAs uh, in uh, highly expressed, highly abundant, middle uh, abundant, and uh, low abundant microRNAs. 
And uh, what you can see here is that for low, a very high abandoned microRNAs, uh, basically you have more or less the same results. Uh, oh, uh, sorry. And uh, for uh, uh, middle um, abandoned microRNAs, you have uh, um, again, uh, a good specificity for uh, sequence-specific RT primers, and you have uh, amplification of uh, universal tailing RT primers, but uh, you start to see a lot of, uh, um, um, let's say, false positive uh, results uh, and uh, uh, something that is not specific and specificity basically a specificity and, uh, and for the low abundant microRNAs uh, uh, the sequence specific RT primers uh, couldn't detect anything uh, the universal tailing primer detected something but is completely unspecific so it seems that uh, uh, the universal tailing RT primers are more specific uh, more sensitive but less specific Again, it's not uh, uh, that one is uh, mm, for sure better than the other, uh, but it really depends on what, uh, what kind of experiments uh, you are running and what are the, the answer you are uh, looking for. Uh, um, <clears throat> Then microarrays. So microarrays, of course, are multi multiplexing. Uh, talking about multiplex uh, multiplexing, actually now there are uh, panels of uh, done with uh, uh, PCR basically. So you have uh, this uh, plate uh, with uh, where in each spot you have uh, the primers for an amplification step. Uh, and uh, this, in this case, you don't have the, the technical triplicates. You have uh, just uh, the, um, the 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 statistical analysis basically is given by using uh, more more samples of the same condition. Uh, this is just to say that for multiplexing now you have also uh, panels uh, with uh, PCR and not just for microarrays. Uh, but talking about microarrays, uh, the problem with microarrays are similar to problem with PCR because you have a high risk of false positive. There is actually low accuracy at single base level, and uh, as you had problem with uh, enzymatic biases in that case was uh, amplification. Here you have ligation biases, biases for from the sequences basically, and uh, um, there is a great interplatform variability. So actually, microarrays now are used less and less for microRNAs, and we had uh, uh, in our lab uh, uh, an experience of interplatform variability. We we basically ran analysis on uh, uh, FFP tissues of uh, lung tumors of CRF uh, transgenic mice, uh, uh, checking at the expression of microRNAs of uh, wild type and CRF uh, uh, mice. And among the, uh, uh, the, the regulated genes uh, uh, of the, both platforms, only one microRNAs uh, was uh, uh, concordant. So there was a big uh, interplatform variability between, in this case, was Affymetric and uh, uh, Agilent. Uh, the other technique is NGS, so next generation sequencing, of course, uh, throughput, uh, multiplexing, uh, it's more sensitive, you have a high dynamic, high dynamic range, but uh, even in this case, we have a lot of preparation problems, so if you are going to use uh, next generation sequencing for microRNAs, you have to be aware of the fact that uh, small RNA uh, preparation, uh, small RNA uh, library preparation is not so easy, and uh, you have to go through not only the normal step for next generation sequencing, so chopping of the of the RNA, ligation, and preamplification. So again, here we have the same enzymatic biases we've seen before, but you have to go through also a size separation uh, step, uh, running through basically a gel. And so again, here you have another step, another possible. Uh, um, bias coming from uh, this uh, uh, step of the protocol and uh, of course then you have uh, uh, it well, really it's quite uh, it's uh, quite time consuming and um, of course the, the the analysis of the next generation sequences is quite complex and uh, there is uh, an improvement with the uh, next next generation sequencing because you have to uh, you can avoid the, the preamplification but uh, uh, if you go to the websites of the, the company, 
uh, of the two Ds uh, that make this next generation sequencing. So they still have some problems in doing uh, uh, sequencing of uh, uh, microarray. So it's not it's it kind of quite uh, tricky. I give you just a, a brief uh, an overview of the the, the NGS uh, and then NGS platform. So you see uh, we have the NGS or so Illumina 454, Ion Torrent, Solid, uh, uh, the main use and some one are not used anymore. So you have uh, sequencing by synthesis or sequencing by ligation, and then uh, uh, the main improvement of an NGS. Uh, Again, uh, it's uh, the uh, we, the fact that they avoid uh, the uh, preamplification step, and then the read length that is extremely extremely higher. But uh, again, for microarrays, uh, it's uh, it's quite uh, it's quite difficult. Then uh, the last thing I want to talk to you about uh, uh, is uh, about uh, the normalization method. So we had we have our expression uh, analysis. Uh, we have our, our expression data basically. Uh, but uh, for the method we saw, we, we need to go through a relative identification. And uh, I report here a graph from uh, again another uh, work we did in our group uh, where. Uh, basically, we uh, checked uh, at uh, different. Uh, um, candidate as possible as uh, reference genes, and uh, the analysis here is a norm finder analysis. And as you can see, the U6 that is basically one of the most used for microRNAs is actually the worst here, because the lower is uh, this value, uh, better is uh, the normalizer. And um, so. I suggest you to, uh, when uh, you do um, uh, an expression analysis of microRNAs, to really to select uh, some uh, uh, possible candidate genes uh, as you, for using them as uh, a normalizer, and run uh, some run some uh, analysis like NormFinder. There is uh, GNorm also. Uh, even in principle, even it's not so accurate, even in just a, a city value analysis, it uh, uh, can, can be good, even if, of course, it's not so uh, statistically robust. And uh, again, uh, going on with, uh, with, uh, with the story of this paper, basically we, we had two conditions from cardiac condition, <coughs> these are tissues, human cardiac tissues, and uh, uh, we had two conditions, so these microRNAs that had this is as a biomarkers by my biomarker, and uh, we normalize it with uh, the best normalizer, so NORM48, and the worst one, U6. And as you can see, there is a big difference. So again, the choice of the normalizer, so the choice of the reference gene is critical. And uh, um, I want to stress the fact that uh, you have to select the reference gene every time you do uh, um, um, an analysis. So for a specific type of analysis, you have to choose your specific reference gene. So for example, for this cardiac tissue kind of analysis, uh, NOR48 was good. If we're doing uh, lung cancer studies, probably there is another reference uh, uh, gene. Uh, for uh, microRNAs. And uh, I give you, for example, just a general overview, for example, what you find in literature for plasma and serum. You find a lot of U6, a lot of U microRNA 16, uh, or also standard cube with synthetic microRNA, like a C. elegans microRNA 39. This also for other uh, uh, diseases, again, the microRNA 16, U6, U6, of course, I'm not uh, um, stopping here just to say that uh, uh, a lot is you. Mm, a lot of uh, groups use these uh, uh, references, but actually, if you see, for example, microRNA 16 uh, is uh, uh, frequently deleted uh, in uh, several diseases. So there is a lot of targets, so actually, it is uh, a kind of trouble microRNA. And then, uh, uh, and I'm basically finishing uh, that. Uh, um, uh, U6, it is uh, uh, a small nuclear RNA involved in the formation of the spliceosome, and uh, it uh, um, the a lot of people are using it in plasma and serum, but actually it shouldn't be there. So uh, be uh, be careful on what you are using, and uh, so uh, select uh, the, a good reference gene. 
So concluding, uh, uh, so the micro analysis has some limitation in uh, pre-analytical factors, so as we saw, source preparation, RNA extraction, then analytical, so what kind of method I want to use to detect these micro -RNAs. and post-analytical, so normalization uh, uh, method and the choice of the right reference. We, the, well, the scientific community is going towards uh, this detection of micro -RNAs, uh, without RNA extraction, without PSCR uh, amplification, possibly, with a single base specificity, and trying to go uh, towards the uh, an absolute uh, quantification to avoid the relative the normalization uh, step. And uh, with this, I finish. And thank you for your attention. And uh, I'm glad to answer to your question if you have any. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Simon. That was very enlightening. Uh, please type your questions into the chat box. Were there questions or not? Yeah, I, I see some typing, so... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, a quick question for me, then, while, while we're waiting. Um, so, I've read a lot about sort of new non-amplification detection methods with, um, I think it's aptamers and, and direct fluorescence probes and so on. What, what do you think about those? Uh, so you, you were saying sorry about di uh, direct uh, method with uh, hybrid like hybridization right uh, without uh, yeah. PCR you saying right yeah uh, well um, let's say that uh, again it really depends on uh, what uh, what kind of experiments you are running uh, I would say and uh, they are let's say preferable compared to PCR because you avoid this uh, enzymatic step that for micronase as we saw is tricky uh, by uh, myself for example I'm working with uh, a technology that uh, is trying to do basically an hybridization of uh, the micronase uh, using uh, PNA molecules and uh, this mainly for diagnostic purposes and for example for diagnostic where you try to avoid possibly false positive uh, results, uh, this is really what you are looking for, something that avoids the pos all possible, uh, uh, possible biases. Well, thank you. I think we have some questions now. Okay. Um, Uh, okay, so, uh, well, answering to um, the first question from uh, Pedro, so about uh, uh, so anti, uh, anti mirror experiments. Well, uh, in, in this case, uh, um, again, uh, the problem uh, may be in, uh, well, the choice of uh, the type of molecule you're using for, uh, uh, for, uh, for, um, for the 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 sorry the uh, the hybridization and so the um, down regulation sorry <laughs> down relation of of microRNAs and uh, one thing I can say is that um, uh, the uh, the use of uh, molecule antisense molecules for for microRNAs uh, is uh, real uh, really an uh, uh, an artificial method for uh, uh, for micronasal regulation. Uh, the main pitfall here, I would uh, uh, at least in my opinion, I would highlight here is that uh, uh, micronase uh, work uh, with a very fine uh, tuning of the expression of gene expression. And when uh, instead when you're working with uh, anti anti sense oligos, you're usually uh, bombing, let's say, the cells uh, or the tissues or whatever with uh, a high amount uh, of, uh, of uh, microRNAs. So you have, uh, an, for example, uh, a big drop down, a big down regulation of a microRNA, which is very not uh, uh, physiological. So uh, the conclusion you may uh, then uh, end it up with, uh, with these experiments, uh, uh, I think have to be uh, 
read very, very careful, uh, carefully in, uh, in that sense. Yeah, perhaps I can also answer the question shortly. Um, we, we have a webinar in the planning stages about antimere experiments, design of antimere agonists and antagonists. Um, so um, hopefully I'll have more news for you in that respect soon. Um, okay, so uh, from an... Uh, uh, okay, the about the the snow the um, the the snow RNAs, uh, uh, the so the uh, monoclear RNAs. Uh, well, these are here are very are very used for microRNAs. Uh, uh, well, U6, U48 are used a lot for. Um, for uh, mailing tissues uh, uh, analysis or in cells analysis, uh, more because uh, of their uh, length. Uh, so the length is, uh, um, of these uh, of these uh, RNAs uh, is uh, more similar to the one of the microRNAs, and uh, it it is debated a lot the fact that uh, uh, you should have uh, let's say more or less the same amplification. Uh, um, conditions for PC, mainly for PCR. So that's why, uh, at least to the best of my knowledge, uh, these, uh, um, uh, these molecules are used as normalizer uh, for microRNAs more than the mechanism in, uh, in this case. Uh, this you would argue more, for example, for JPDH. And uh, about uh, the one normalizer, uh, well, uh, um, it really depends again on what you are uh, what you're trying to do uh, but uh, again the use of more than one normalizer is uh, is used in literature a lot uh, could be a solution could be a solution if you uh, want to increase uh, uh, the reliability of your normalization uh, but this may be not always the case uh, again uh, more in the field, for example, of diagnostics, and you are trying to, in this case, to use uh, as micro as less microRNAs as possible, and so you, you try to use one normalizer. But for other uh, uh, applications, uh, it could be a it could be a good uh, a good, good solution. Actually, for example, for microarrays, uh, what uh, is used a lot is uh, uh, the geometric mean or the global mean normalization. So uh, using basically either all uh, microRNAs or uh, uh, a group, uh, a set of them. Uh, about the question of the, the, the age of uh, samples, uh, well, there, uh, there is uh, mm, quite, uh, well, let's say, mm, a good amount of literature uh, talking about uh, uh, samples, the storage of the samples, uh, and uh, how much time, for example, they were kept uh, at room temperature at a minus, minus 80, and so uh, answering also to the question of uh, uh, how age and how the storage of the sample could impact on that. And uh, if I if I understood correctly, uh, I will uh, give uh, to Petra a list of uh, uh, papers or publication, uh, and uh, I can include some uh, that uh, talk about uh, about this, and so you can uh, then check about uh, uh, the data. Yes, yes, we will add a, a list of references to the website, so people can directly click through to PubMed. Are there any more questions? No, then um, thank you very much for everyone uh, to uh, every everyone attending this webinar. Uh, the next OTS webinar will be on the 21st of March. The website should be up soon, and it will be Keys Gagnon, and he will be talking about an um, overview of chemical modifications to CRISPR RNA, and that will be on the 21st of March. Hope to see you there. Thank you very much, Simon. That was really Thank great you. talk. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye.